beautiful Lord's Day, and we're thankful that everybody gets to be here together for our Bible study, and looking forward to another great day together. We're so thankful for each and every one of our mothers that are in attendance this morning. What a great blessing our mothers are. We're so thankful for each and every one of you, for all that you mean for your families, and especially for all that you mean right now for the church. So what a great, great day that we get to come together and worship our God. If you want to, go ahead and turn to Revelation 4. This is where we'll be this morning. But before we get into our study of the text, I will have a prayer, and then we will get ready to go. All right, let's pray. Our God, we are thankful for our beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful for the opportunity to study from your word, to be overwhelmed with your presence, your glory, and to live our lives in response to the things that we have seen. Father, we are thankful for this church. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless her and to help us all to do great things for your glory. Make us to be great evangelists. Make us to be faithful. Make us to look to you in everything. Father, we pray that you will forgive all of our trespasses and help us to live for you to the best that we can as we are gracious to those around us. Father, we pray that you will continue to use us here in this church to reach around the world so that the lost might be saved. Father, we're thankful for your Son, for the Spirit. Father, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to be with you forever in glory and that we get to enjoy life with you now. We pray, Father, all these things in the name of our Savior. Amen. All right, here in Revelation 4, we make a bit of a transition. Actually, it's a pretty huge transition. As we have studied already the incredible prologue there in chapter 1, now having covered briefly the seven churches of Asia, we get to chapter 4 and we are encountering again another throne room scene of God. And chapter 4 is incredibly important for the rest of the book because chapters 4 and 5 together compose the foundation for everything else, chapters 4 and 5 together. So it'd really be better for us to study 4 and 5 together in sitting, but we really, I don't think, are going to have time for that. Uh, If somebody didn't talk so much, maybe we could, but I don't think we're going to be able to do chapters 4 and 5 together in one sitting, but it's important for you to know that structurally, as far as the way the Lord has inspired John to lay out the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5 are one textual unit. You should think of these two chapters as one chapter, okay? Okay. This is one textual unit, one literary unit, upon which the rest of the book is based. So here in chapter 4, we have this overwhelming vision of God, where again, it is worship. And we will see the Father, we will see the Holy Spirit, but in chapter 4, the question is, where is the Son? Where is the one who is going to make all of history... uh, Begin. Who, where is the son who is going to be in charge of history? And so it's not until we get to chapter 5 in which John asks, who is worthy to take the scroll and to unleash the seals? And the one that does that is the son. So in chapter 4, we focus on the Father, we focus on the Spirit. In chapter 5, then finally, we see the Son come onto the stage and set all of history or the rest of history into motion. In this way, John has presented to us a reason to worship in chapter 4 as we look to God as uh, overwhelming, as transcendent, as holy. But in chapter 5, we look to the Son as equally divine, transcendent, and holy, but also the One who has set in motion everything else. So from the time of the Incarnation until His second coming, Jesus is in control. Now as we think about chapters 4 and 5 together as a unit this way, we can see how important this is for the rest of the book. Because the rest of the book can be quite scary, and it is scary as we look through the imagery and see the reality of daily life for Christians. We see a lot of chaos, we see a lot of turmoil, we see a lot of trials and tribulations, we see a lot of things that we don't understand. But as we go through the rest of the book, 
with the three cycles of seals, trumpets, and bowls, and finally uh, the last judgment in the last two chapters, what we find is really and truly that Jesus is in control. He is the one who has taken the scroll of destiny, unleashed the seals. He's in control of everything that is going on. Now, like Job, we do not understand what's going on. We don't understand why, but we do know who is in charge. We do know who is the scroll of destiny. We do know who has unleashed the seals. We do know that He has a purpose. We do know that He's got His people. And we do know the end of the story that we're able to read about in Revelation. So that makes things all right. Even though we don't understand, we don't know a lot of things that we would like to know, we do know who's in charge and we do know who's going to provide for us and protect us ultimately. So that is the overarching message of chapters 4 and 5. Now with that in mind then, let's go back to chapter 4 and verse 1 so that we can study a little bit more detail the text here for us today. There, John says, after this... So after these seven letters to the seven churches, after this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Again, he is alluding, echoing back to Daniel and Ezekiel, the way they set up these visions. But John is saying, I'm seeing something that I'm not really supposed to see, as it were. I'm getting a glimpse into the next world. I'm getting a glimpse into God's timeless existence. I'm able to see into that heavenly throne room. You can imagine someone sitting there outside the temple day after day and what's going on inside, in the place, in the most holy place, hoping to have just a glimpse of the interior of the temple until finally maybe one of those curtains was left open for just a little bit and they could see into the holy place, not the most holy place, that would be too terrifying, but be able to see into the most holy place and have a glimpse of this earthly representation of the heavenly temple. John here is given that very opportunity, except he is given a glimpse into the most holy place in the heaven, the place where God really is. And so you can put yourself in John's position so that he is overwhelmed with what God is able, what God is like, what God is doing, what's going on behind the curtain in God's timeless existence. This is what is being given to John here in chapter 4 in verse 1. The door standing open in heaven. In my translation, there's an exclamation point following that. And this is really the way we need to read it. That we're able to see what's going on beyond creation in this ultimate reality. And so John says, the first voice which I heard, had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this or after these things. So now John hears this incredible voice that is described here as like a trumpet. Now the trumpet is of course an instrument that is used for summoning. uh, But we need to go back to the ancient world and think about what that trumpet would have been like. Uh, You really need to think of the shofar, right? A ram's horn. It's not, you know. A trumpet that you would play in the band. It's not a Sam Dream trumpet. Oh, he's a drummer. Anyway, uh, but instead, this is a shofar, ram's horn that would have been blown. And the tradition is that they picked the shofar to blow that way because it sounded similar to the rumbling of God's presence on Sinai. So as you have all of these shofars blowing at the same time, you are overwhelmed, not with a really pretty sound, but instead you are overwhelmed with this incredible, loud, disturbing noise. And so the voice that John hears is like the trumpet. It is like the shofar. It is resembling God's presence at Sinai as He spoke to the people and made them to be Israel as we know them to function throughout the rest of the Old Testament and into the New. But He is also scaring them to death by the sound of His presence. 
And that needs to all be filtered into Revelation 4.1 as John hears this voice that is like a trumpet and this terrifying voice says, come up here and I will show you what must be after this. Now this invitation is absolutely incredible. Because not only has John been able to get a glimpse inside of God's timeless existence, a glimpse past creation, but now he has been invited to enter that existence. He has been invited to see a glimpse of what God is like. He has been invited to see past the curtain of creation to ultimate reality to see what's really going on. So he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place. And then after this. Now we do not need to read this as a chronological thing. That you have the seven churches of Asia. And now here's what's going to happen after the seven churches of Asia. Instead, uh, after these things here uh, in verse 1, uh, we need to see this as just after that vision. right? This is a typical way of introducing a new vision. That after this segment, textually... Now we have this vision. Now we can see that, number one, because that's just text, textually how we should understand it. But number two, as we have the seven churches of Asia, and then we get into this throne room scene of God in chapter 4, we know that God and His existence, God and His nature is timeless. That's why He is the one who was, is, and he, the Alpha and the Omega, He is the God that does not change, as we have seen repeatedly throughout the Scriptures. So this vision of God is going to be timeless. It's not going to be a part of this time-bound creation. Instead, this is the way things are, eternally or timelessly. And so we see this is God's eternal nature, but it's also a revelation of God's eternal plan, that we're able to see beyond the door, we're being brought in with John to see what God's plan for all is. And that's what the rest of the book of Revelation will be about. So in verse 2, he says, at once I was in the Spirit. Now this is just another way of describing John as an Old Testament prophet. At this time, it's been uh, 70 years since the resurrection or 60 years since the resurrection, uh, but we can see John presenting himself as a prophet, receiving a vision, receiving a revelation. To be in the Spirit is to receive a revelation. This is the way John is using that phrase. So at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and one seated upon the throne. So then, we are beginning to see images of God. Uh, we're going to see pictures of God that communicate something to us, but the way that they communicate to us is through this imagery that isn't quite literally true. Instead, it is metaphorically true. Because, as we know, God is spirit. And as Jesus said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have after the resurrection, remember? So God is spirit. He does not have a body, right? So people that do not have a body, do they sit in thrones? Do they sit anywhere? Well, no. Why? Because they don't have a body with which to sit. Also, do they have thrones? It wouldn't make much sense, would it? It would be like me having scuba gear. I'm not going to need it, so I'm not going to have it. So, the Lord does not have a body. The Father and Son and Spirit do not have a physical body. And so, they do not have a physical throne. So, what we are being told here is a truth... But we are being presented this truth with imagery or metaphorical language. So then, as we see God sitting in His throne here in Revelation 4, what we are being told is that God reigns. That God is sovereign. God is in control. 
God is the King of kings and Lord of lords. God is the boss. God is the one that sets everything in motion. And this is important for people who feel like their life is in chaos, for people who feel like their life is in turmoil, for people who feel like everything is completely out of control and they don't know where to turn next. God is the one sitting on the throne in heaven. And as we look at these seven churches of Asia, each of them struggling with the pagan temples around them, with these pagan deities as they are represented, you can see them all either sitting in a throne or standing at their throne. But as we look at God, we see that He is not sitting in an earthly throne that has to be built and protected, but instead we see God seated in the heavenly throne far superior to any challenger that He might have. He is seated in heaven upon His throne. He is sovereign. He is eternally, timelessly in control. And there is nothing that we need to worry about. Instead, we need to trust Him who is seated on the throne. We need to trust Him who is in charge. We need to trust Him who is sovereign. So He is the one seated on the throne. Just a little caveat here. Even though the Son and Spirit are going to be pictured differently, we should not extrapolate from that that they are not sharing in the Father's sovereignty. The Father, Son, and Spirit share one divine essence. There are three persons with one essence. And so if the Father is sitting on the throne, if He is sovereign, then so is the Son and Spirit. Remember in John 1... Uh, that in the beginning, timelessly, was the Word. And the Word was what? With God. And whatever God was, so too the Word was. And so if the Father is seated upon the throne, if He is sovereign, so too is the Son, and so too is the Spirit, because they share this divine essence. The Son and Spirit are not second and third place deities. They're not second and third place gods. Instead, they all share in that divine essence. They are all sovereign. But then we begin here in Revelation 4 and 5 to see these different roles which are particular to each of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So we have to keep that differentiation as well. So in verse two, verse, uh, what, what, verse 3, And he who sat there had the appearance of a jasper and a carnelian stone, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Now, as you check and compare uh, various translations, you'll see those stones are translated differently. It's because we're not entirely sure which ones John was talking about. But you will be tempted to look at each of those stones and try and figure out something about the nature of God. Here's where I want to caution you not to be distracted by the pretty pictures. Remember I said in the introduction, one of the worst things we can do is be distracted with the pretty pictures and forget the message, right? Don't be distracted with the pretty pictures. Instead, just be in awe of the scene. And so what we have presented to us is a God who looks splendid like jewels. A God who is presented to us here as reflecting light, being Himself the source of light. A God who is glorious. A God that we want to look at. A God that we want to focus on. A God that is absolutely incredible. Just like, fellas, you remember when you picked out that engagement ring? And the little salesman had to tell you all about it, right? Right? But then you presented the engagement ring, and you said, will you marry me? And she immediately said, what? How many carrots is it? What, what sort of a cut is it? Exactly what sort of a rock is this? No, the message was clear, wasn't it? This is what we need to see here with Revelation. The message is there, even though the symbols can be quite intricate and confusing, The symbols are not what's important. The message the symbol communicates is what's important. And so here we have this God who is incredible. But then we have the rainbow around Him, around the throne. 
Now, if you'll look back in your Bible to the Old Testament text again, you begin to see that this is used in the Old Testament in two different ways. Ezekiel uses the rainbow as a way to describe the glory of God. Because when you look at a rainbow, that's what you think of, isn't it? You look at that rainbow and you think of majesty. You think of royalty. You think of things that are awesome, things that are beautiful. We go back even further and you'll remember that after the flood, God had set His war bow in the clouds as a reminder that He would never again destroy the earth with water. And so every time that we look back at that covenant sign of a rainbow, we remember God's covenant promise that He will never again destroy the earth with water. That covenant, thankfully, has not been superseded. It continues, doesn't it? And we continue to look at the rainbow as a reminder of God's mercy and of God's faithfulness and of God's providence so that as we look here in Revelation 4 and we see the rainbow around the throne, we not only are reminded of the imagery from Ezekiel, but we also need to go back to the imagery after the flood to see again, not a literal rainbow, but we need to see God's faithfulness, God's mercy, and God's love as it is presented to us here in this covenant sign of the rainbow. In verse 4, he goes on to a scene that is a bit easier, perhaps, maybe. Around the throne are the 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones are 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. There is several discussions being had about exactly what these 24 elders represent. If we'll go back to 1 Chronicles 24 through 26, we will see there that some Levitical priests are prescribed by God through David to be 24 of them around the temple there for worship. They are the ones who are prescribed to carry out the worship of God as it is presented to us in the book of Psalms. So we have these 24 royal priests who are always, this is their job, is to worship God. Their job is to praise. And so what we see here in heaven is perhaps another glimpse of that, but a heavenly reality. Not an earthly shadow, but a heavenly reality. We also are probably more familiar with the idea that we have the 12 tribes of Israel and then the 12 apostles. So if you put them all together, the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints, you would have 24 representatives. There's some Old Testament basis for this as well. Uh, whenever you look back to Exodus 24 or Isaiah 24, you see uh, this idea somewhat. Uh, the Jews throughout their um, interpretations and commentaries on those passages had begun to see an old covenant people and a new covenant people represented by 24 uh, royal worshipers. And so we have an Old Testament background for that as well. And so the question that we ask is, which one is right? That's probably not the right question to ask. The Jews have absolutely no problem mixing their metaphor. Now we, we're like, you don't mix metaphors, right? One symbol means one thing. That's the way we're all taught. But the Jews were taught exactly the opposite. If you can get a metaphor to mean four billion different things, let's aim for four billion in one, right? Let's see how much depth, how much thought we can put into this image. And so perhaps we are supposed to see both of these images in the 24 elders that are surrounding the throne. That they are the heavenly representatives of all of God's people. But what is it that all of God's people are doing? They're worshiping God. This is their full-time occupation. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing anyway? To have as our full-time occupation some sort of service devoted to the Lord? But as we look at these 24 elders, who I do think in some way represent all of God's people, we see exactly what it is that they are doing. Number one, they are clothed in white garments. Notice that this is a passive thing. They are clothed with purity and victory 
here in heaven. They are clothed with white garments. They have golden crowns upon their heads. They are they're the royal priesthood that God has made for Himself so that He can be worshipped. They have the golden crowns on their head, but in verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning the seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Now let's first go back to all of the noise around the throne. All of this sounds suspiciously like Sinai. As God descended upon the mountain, this is the way His presence was manifested. And so as John is looking at the presence of God, he is overwhelmed and he says, this is exactly like what it was like at Sinai. I was in the presence of God. And as a creature, this is what I felt. This is what I experienced. The fear, the dread that would have been evident at Sinai because of God's presence. But then we see this allusion to Zechariah. Remember Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi? Back in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, to the seven spirits of God which are before the throne. Uh, if you'll look back there to Zechariah 4, and practically all Christian interpretation of Zechariah 4 and of Revelation would have us to understand that the seven spirits of God is just a way of referring to the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. So then, why is it that, uh, it is, that the Holy Spirit is presented that way. Well, He's presented both as a light, as a torch, as fire. He is presented here as the seven spirits of God. The number seven, like the word holy, has to do with things that are God or associated with God. As we look at the seven spirits of God, we have what could be seen as a synonym for the Holy Spirit. Because the number seven has to do with things that are holy, right? If you can do some algebra for a second. Seven spirits on one side of the equation, Holy Spirit on the other side of the equation. You can put an equal sign in between them because they mean the same thing. Okay? So the seven spirits of God are not seven spirits that are there around the throne, but it is most likely a way of referring to the Holy Spirit, the seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, how do we get those two images together? Well, obviously, a torch of fire is not a spirit, right? So we, we're being told already that we're looking at something else other than a literal interpretation, a literal reading of the text. But what is it that the Spirit does? Well, he does a lot of things. The question was misleading. What's the one thing that we think of mostly in the New Testament? The Spirit reveals. The Spirit makes known the things of God. How is it that we know what God is like? The Spirit of God searches the deep things of God and He has revealed these things to us. What does a torch in a dark room do? It lights up the room so you can see what things are, what things are like. That's what the Holy Spirit has done with Revelation. He has turned the light on so that we can see God. So that we can see the Spirit, the Son, and the Father. This is what then uh, we see described with the Holy Spirit being the seven torches of God, which are the seven spirits of God. Because they are sh the Spirit is showing us this timeless, eternal reality. He is the door that was standing open in heaven. He is the one uh, of whom John said, I was in the Spirit, and now I can see this. Now we can see this too, because the Spirit has revealed these things to us. So, uh, let's go on here to verse 6. And before the throne there was as it were, right? So this is not as it is, it is as it were. There was before the throne as it were a sea of like crystal. Now, this throne room scene is going to be the pattern for which the earthly tabernacle was built, right? Right? I mean, you, you've read Hebrews before, right? So, this earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple, 
was a shadow. It was a dim reflection of the heavenly reality. Well, the laver was there in the tabernacle and in the temple to represent the holiness that stood between God's presence and creation. And in order to get into God's holy presence, the priest would first have to ascend to the laver, this big wash bowl, and what would they do? They would wash so that they could then be ritually pure and go into God's presence. What do we find in heaven? We find this sea of glass, as it were, a laver, through which we see the holiness of God contrasted with everything else, but also a way to God, because if we will wash, we can go into God's presence. We do not have a laver in Christian worship, but we do have baptism. We do have a washing before we go in to God's presence. As individuals began to build church buildings in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries, and continuing for quite some time after, before you could get into the auditorium where they would worship, just like we have our auditorium, if you would walk through the door there, right, they would have their baptistry back there. Because before you could come into worship, you would be baptized. You would be cleansed. You would be purified before you could come in and be a part of God's people. And so the baptistry at the back had a huge symbol, or was a huge symbol, for the people that wanted to be a part of the church, for people that wanted to be a part of God's family. Before they could enter into praise, they had to be purified because they were unholy. Isn't that a beautiful way of thinking of it? No, I'm not for moving the baptistry. Our baptistry is pretty good. If you haven't noticed, it's really hard to keep a baptistry clean. But this is one of the cleanest baptistries I've ever seen in my life. So let's just leave it alone. Whatever's going on up there, just don't touch it. It's doing pretty good. Uh, but they would have their baptistry in the back. All right, well, let's go on here uh, to um, the rest of verse 6. Around the throne and on each side of the throne were four living creatures. Uh, the, the word here is Zoe, or Zoa, right? So we have these four living creatures. Now, we're going to read some pretty weird stuff. I don't want you to have any nightmares tonight. But I also don't want you to get distracted with imagery and remember that we're being told something. So these four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature was like a lion. The second creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings, like the cherubim in Isaiah 6. Okay, That's the one major connection that we can make real easy. The cherubim in Isaiah 6, six wings. We get over here, what do we find? Six winged creatures of some sort. Uh, so we have these, um, verse 8, each of them had six wings. They are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now what does that sound like? What happens in Isaiah 6? the same thing, isn't it? It's the same thing. So as we have Isaiah 6, we have Revelation 4. If we can understand Isaiah 6 a little bit, then we can understand Revelation 4 a little bit, can't we? Now what's going on with all of these different faces? Uh, a lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. Well, I'll just tell you, I don't know. Okay? Y'all okay with that? I don't know. What's the deal with having eyes all around? Well, it's Mother's Day. Do any of you mothers have eyes in the back of your head? Well, you got sort of the same thing going on here, right? God's special servants who are around His throne are there. They are presented this way perhaps because they are over all creation. Perhaps because this is echoing Daniel's visions of kingdoms. But either way, we see that God is sovereign over His creation, 
And he is omniscient. He knows everything. And he's also fierce. He's over absolutely everything and he does as he wishes. But then these four living creatures, what is it that they do? They're praising God. They're praising God. So these four living creatures that represent God's divine attributes are here crying out, just like in Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy. The thrice holy God. The personification of holiness. The word holy has, first of all, to do with things of God. This is the way the word is used to deal with things of God. So God Himself is holy. Things that are associated with God then become holy because they are associated with God, but their holiness is derived. God's holiness is just inherent. It's just the way He is. The holiness that creatures have is a derived holiness, right? Sort of like, have y'all ever eaten at Five Guys Burgers and Fries? The burger itself is greasy. The bag and whatever you set the bag on becomes greasy because the burger was there. Right? So it is with holiness. God Himself is holy. And whatever God comes in contact with then becomes holy because it's in contact with God. But God here is described as the personification of Holiness, he is presented here as holy, as God. And this is how he is worshipped. You are holy, holy, holy. He is the Lord God Almighty. And then we see the second refrain that he is the one who was and is and is to come. Now this goes back to Exodus three fourteen and 15 as God reveals his name to Moses, really in two different forms there in verse 14 and 15, but it's the same word that has to do with the idea of to be, right? So it could be translated I am or I will be, but either way, we have historically understood this to be a, a uh, way of describing God as true, pure being, that He does not become. Instead, He is. There is no way for God to grow because He is already the fullness of life. He is already true blessedness. God does not change because He is what He will be. And so we see this described for us here as the one who was, is, and is to come. He is the one that stands outside of time But as we journey outside of time, we will find the same God that created with absolutely no change whatsoever. In verse 9, whenever the living creatures, the Zoe, give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. Whatever glory they had was a gift from God, just like with us. Whatever good and perfect gift that we have is a gift from above from the Father of lights. Whatever good thing we have is from the Lord, and what do these heavenly representatives exemplify for us. Whatever good thing we have from God, we need to return to God. That we are unworthy creatures, and all we can do is return everything that we have and everything that we are for God's glory. So they cast their crowns before the Lord and worship Him who lives forever and ever. In verse 11, they say, Worthy! Are you our Lord and God to receive glory, honor, and power? The word worthy is the Old English uh, root of worship. Uh, the Old English word is worship. So he alone is worthy of worship. To receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. 
So we see that God is praised. I also want you to note the difference between the creature and the creator even in heaven. Even these four living creatures are praising God who alone is worthy. The angels are not worshipped. The angels are not praised. God alone is praised and God alone is worthy of worship. As we get next week into chapter 5, all of these things will be hugely important for understanding who the Son is as He takes the scroll and unleashes the rest of Christian history. All right, we'll be dismissed.
visitors are with us. We're always glad to, and happy that you're with us, and please come back and visit with us anytime you have the opportunity. We want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Hope that you have a very uh, special day today. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. Uh, please remember uh, Lisa Miller in your prayers. Uh, she's a sister-in-law to Betty Rose Henry and Wendy Robertson, uh, and she's in uh, grave condition in Jackson, Tennessee. So uh, please keep her in your prayers and her, her family. Also, please remember the family of Debbie McCoy. This is Bonnie Jordan's daughter, uh, Lori Cagle's sister. Uh, she passed away this past week in Texas. Um, please keep this family in your prayers. I have a note from Gracie Hobson. Uh, so to my church family, I'm so thankful to you for, uh, for your kindness, generosity, and words of encouragement during this special time. The church here at Ripley will always hold a special place in my heart. I have covet your prayers as I move forward to this next chapter of life. Gracie Hobson. So we wish all the seniors the very best in the future. Uh, order of worship today, uh, Tucker Shapley is going to lead us in song. Uh, Nathan Stanford will read from God's Word today. Michael Harrison will lead us in our opening prayer. Our Lord's Supper will be conducted by Nathan Robertson. Uh, Donnie DeBoard will bring the message to us. And at the close of service today, uh, we'll be dismissed by James Horton. At this time, we'll turn the service over to Tucker. You will please stand. So we sing all three verses of Blue Skies and Rainbows. <clears throat> Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never. I live for each day, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart, never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys. aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Never more will I be all alone since he promised me that we never seated. <clears throat> song before our scripture reading and prayer this morning will be number 574, Oh How I Love Jesus. Sing all three verses of 574. <clears throat> there is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word, earth it sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth.
Today's scripture reading will come from Genesis 1, 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Would you bow with me, please? Our most holy, righteous, loving Heavenly Father, who is the creator of all things, and the giver of all good gifts. Father, we praise thee. We hope that our worship will be acceptable in thy sight this morning as we come together as your congregation, as your church, to worship you, the one true and living God. Father, we know that we're sinful. We know that we're weak. We pray, Father, for strength, and we ask for forgiveness of our sin so that we may be better servants for you and pray father that we'll be looking for ways that we can help others and let our light shine in this community father we're mindful of those that are on our prayer list those that are hurting those that are going through difficult times we pray father that you would be with them that they would look to you for comfort and that father that you would use us in ways that we can be of assistance to them Father, we're mindful of those that have recently lost loved ones. We're especially mindful of the Debbie McCoy family. We pray that your comforting hand be upon them and that they will be um, comforted during this time by their family and by the friends and those that love them. Father, we know that we would are trying to do more for for you each and every day, we're so thankful for the ministers that we have at this congregation. We're thankful for Brother Donnie and for his family and for the good work that he does in teaching and preaching your word. We're thankful for Cole and for Tucker and for the excellent work they're doing with our youth. We pray, Father, your richest blessings upon them and that you will continue to use them in thy service. We're thankful for our young people, especially our seniors. We're thankful for the examples that they set. We pray, Father, that you would continue to be with them in this next journey of their life as they go on to college and they start to go out on their own. We pray, Father, that you will be with them and that they will look to you during the times and challenging times that they will have upcoming and that they'll always stay close to you. Father, we pray that you would Continue to be with us, this congregation as we strive to, to serve you in, in ways that we often don't know and the ways that we uh, can't see. We pray, Father, that you'll open our eyes to give us the strength and courage to do things that we need to do and to always look for opportunities to serve our community and each other. We're thankful for each and every member. We're thankful for the talent that we have at this congregation. We pray, Father, that uh, you'll continue to bless us in this way and that we'll use the talents that we have to better serve thee. Father, please go with us through the rest of this service. We pray that, again, our, our worship will be acceptable to thee. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. And amen. In order to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 383. Sing all three verses of 383. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fire.
partake of this Lord's Supper. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. As we are gathered here this morning around this table, we are here to memorialize the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 22, 19 says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread that we will soon eat memorializes that great sacrifice. It memorializes the physical body that Jesus had, the life that he lived, and the teaching and the miracles that he left each one of us. Also, he continues in Luke 22, 20, says, says, And likewise the cup, after they eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood. Likewise, the juice that we will soon drink will help us to remember the life that was given for each one of us, the blood that was shed for our sins and our transgressions. The death of Jesus is a tremendous and precious gift. So the question becomes, how should we receive this great gift? We should receive it with great gratitude and joy. The Lord's Supper, while a memorial, is not a funeral. Jesus is not dead. We partake of this memorial knowing that Jesus has overcome death. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 says, Since therefore the, child, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. As we look back to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, let us truly reflect on this memorial. Let us reflect on the fact that God's only son came to this world. He took upon himself our sins and our transgressions, died a cruel death on the cross, but was raised on the third day, and that through him we can have eternal life. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have this opportunity to assemble around our table to reflect upon the sacrifice that your son was willing to endure for our sins and our transgressions. We pray that as we partake of this bread that represents his body, that we'll do it in a manner and pleasing will in your sight. Just we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
So this time is good. Thanks for the cup. My Father in heaven, at this time we reflect upon the blood that your precious Son shed for our sins. We pray this. We take of this cup that represents that blood. They would do so in a manner pleasing in your sight. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, let's uh, give thanks for our many blessings. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the many spiritual blessings that we enjoy. At this time, we give thee thanks for all the material blessings that we have, for the talents and the abilities that each one of us possess through your blessing that we can go out and earn a living for ourselves and our families. We pray as we give at this, port, at this time that we'll do so with our cheerful heart, that these monies might be used to further thy kingdom here on earth. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
Bidding us look to realms above While the light from the throne shines for you and me Let us listen to the call of love Zion's call is ringing Coming from the throne above While we Good morning, so good to see everyone today. I know that you are having a great Mother's Day. We are thankful for all of our mothers in the audience today, all of the mothers that we have had. Uh, we look around and we see so many great people that have done so many wonderful things. Maybe they have uh, been your mother or just adopted you as their mother, but in this congregation there are so many who have shaped the future more blessedly because of their work and their motherly influence. And I know that we appreciate each and every one of you so much. And you deserve much, much more than just one day a year to have thanks and recognition for all of the great things uh, that you do all, every day of the year. But as we think of mothers, we understand that mothers shape our lives probably maybe more than anyone else. Our mothers are the ones that raise us up. They teach us how to talk. They feed us and in doing so help us to decide what foods that we like. They help us to learn how to speak and in doing so they help us to learn how that we're going to talk. They form our language. They form our habits. They form our likes and dislikes. They shape the people that we're going to like, the friends that we're going to have. What would life be without our great mothers. Every time I think about mothers and the importance of Mother's Day, I remember that children's book, Are You My Mother? You all remember that book where you have this little bird that was wandering around and couldn't find its mother. And it would go up to different things like a truck and say, Are you my mother? And of course this big dump truck was not this little bird's mother. But the little bird was frantically going around town trying to find his mother so that he would have the right person to take care of him, help him to be the best bird that he can be and understand what it is to be a bird and to live as a bird and to be a happy bird while he was living. Now our mothers do the same things for us, don't they? They help us to know who we are. They help us to know how it is we're supposed to live. And they help us to know how to live a blessed, happy life because they are our mothers. You know, as we think about mother's influence, we remember that mothers have a unique ability to say, because I 
said so. Because I said so. So we think about why are we having this for dinner? It's because mama said so. Why is it that we are going to bed at 8.30? It's because mama said so. They are shaping our lives and influencing us for the better. Now in our culture that is struggling so much with the question not only of authority, but who is the authority, we see now that that question that has been addressed since the 1950s and 60s has come down to us and we ask ourselves, who am I and who gets to decide who I am? What is my identity? How is it that I'm supposed to live? How am I supposed to view myself? What is my life supposed to look like? And our godly mothers help us to shape those things. But ultimately, of course, those are questions that are too big even for mothers. And our godly mothers know not to say just because I said so, but because God said so. As we go back to Genesis 1 and verse 1 this morning, we run into one of the most controversial scriptures in all the Bible, one of the most influential scriptures in all the Bible, because there in Genesis 1 and verse 1, we find God as our Creator claiming His sovereign control over everything in creation. So that God is our creator, and because of that, God determines who you are, what your life is going to be like, and how you should live your life. You see, this is a divine prerogative because He is our sovereign life giver. Now, I got this sermon title from something that I think Evie said a few weeks ago as she was talking about her mother. She said, you are my life giver. And in fact, I think if you'll check my Sophie's phone, she has, you know how you can put different names in there for different people. She has as the caller ID for Jesse, life giver. I think that's pretty good. It's a lot better than life taker, but she's got life giver. The other has been threatened, I think, but she is the life giver. But when we think of our God, we run into the one who is our sovereign life giver. And we begin our study of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 when God says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the first thing that we run into in this section of Scripture is of course that God is our Creator, but as we think about that, we of course want to know what is God like? Now there is an emphasis here in Genesis 1 as with the plagues that were brought upon Egypt as to which God is the true God. And in each of the days of creation, God shows Himself to be superior to the inferior Egyptian deities, just like he does with the ten plagues. But that is not really our focus here this morning as we look here at our sovereign life giver in Genesis 1 and verse 1. We are introduced to him as simply our creator. He is the one that makes us to be. But since he is the creator, it's only right that we understand that he is not created. As we see in the book of Colossians, that everything that is, everything that began to be, was made by Him. And without Him was not anything made, nothing came into being that has been made. Because He is the one that made absolutely everything. Or if we'll look in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4, we find that every house is built by someone, and the builder of all things is God. But of course that tells us that God does not have a builder. God does not have someone that put Him together so that He can be God. Instead, God just always is. He's not made up of different stuff. He's just God. And so we say all that is in God is God. God is also without change because as we look here in Genesis 1, we see that He created time and space. And since He created time and space, we know that He is outside of time and space. He Himself does not change, but He brought into being everything that 
does change. That's why we can hold to the unchanging hand of God as we often sing about. As we read about in Scripture, we know that we can have confidence in God to supply all of our needs because in James 1 and verse 17, He is the God who is without variation or shadow due to change. Whenever the Israelites really deserved condemnation, God said in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6 that it is because I do not change that you are not destroyed, O house of Israel. So as we look at God as simply God and nothing but God, uncomposed, uncreated, the Creator of all things, we see that He does not change. He is always God. He is always perfect. He is always the full source of life and the utmost extreme blessedness that is beyond what we could ever imagine. This is the God that we love, adore, and cling to. And this is the God that Paul preached over here in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 23, Paul began to preach to these men the unknown God. The Creator God that they needed to know to bring satisfaction and direction to their life. So Paul says there, the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. You can see there God's transcendence, how God is omnipresent. He is everywhere and every time at the same time, that there is no place that we can go where God is not. David took comfort in that when he said, If I ascend into the highest heavens, thou art there. And if I descend into Sheol, behold, thou art there. There is nowhere that you can run where His rod and staff cannot comfort you. Because everywhere you go, God is already there. At every time in that space that you venture, God has already been there eternally. You are always surrounded by your Creator. You are always surrounded by the One who gives you life. You are always surrounded by the One who loves you. He is, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Rather, He is always always everywhere with you. But as we see in verse 25, that He is not served by human hands as though He needed anything. He doesn't need you to take care of Him. Instead, He gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. He is the one that supplies without losing. He gives absolutely everything without needing anything Himself. Our mothers are great representatives of that. They're great examples of being givers and never really receiving enough. But God doesn't need any reception. God doesn't depend upon anything. He just gives and gives and gives so that we can live, so that we have life, and so that we have our future. In verse 26 though, Paul goes on to say that God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places for this purpose, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, though He is not actually far from us, for it is in Him that we live and move and have our being, as even some of their own prophets, their own philosophers said, for indeed we are His offspring. Look at the majestic nature of God that Paul here is expounding to these philosophers on the Areopagus. He wants them and God wants us to know that God has put us exactly where and when He wants us to be for this purpose, so that we will seek after Him. As we look at this great purpose statement for all of creation, isn't it incredible? That we look at this purpose statement for all of creation to know that God has a purpose for your life. Now as we think about Mother's Day and their influence and all of their hopes and dreams for us, we understand how much we want their approval. As we have had a great uh, college uh, graduation yesterday, look forward to our high school graduates here in just a few days. We see they are going out in the world trying to see what is my life going to be like? What are my goals going to be? But here God says, 
this is your goal, this is what you need to strive for, that I have put you when and where you are so that you will seek after me. The blessings you have in your life are here so that you will look for the Lord. And just as our godly mothers try to exemplify and follow God's pattern there, they're trying to help us to see the most important thing about our life is that we follow God, that we strive to know God, and that we try to live with Him today and forever. That's what our God is like. But once we know that, then we can better understand what creation is like. Going back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we see, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That God is the one who made everything that has been made. Now what can we learn there? We can see that everything in creation then is a theater for God's glory. That the heavens proclaim the handiwork of God. As we look to each and every person that has ever been made, we see that they are made from conception in the image of God and remain the image of God for the rest of their lives, even as they enter into their eternal reward, they are there to reflect their Creator's glory. They are there to reflect that God created them, that God is powerful, that God is amazing, that God is a God of love who desires to be in relationship with us, that God is a God who makes us to be people so that His purposes are fulfilled and we are brought up into those beautiful purposes. This is who our God is. He made us to reflect His nature. He made us to reflect His love. He made us to reflect His glory. He made us in His own image for those reasons. But as we go back over to Acts chapter 17, we see again Paul extrapolating on the fact that God is our Creator. The Apostle Paul there says that God doesn't need anything. He doesn't dwell with temples made with hands. Instead, He gives life and breath to all. Just like your mother's supply to you so much, God gives you absolutely everything. As we know that we are here because our mothers allowed us to be here, we see that God makes us to be here because He wills us to be here. So we look to Him for every blessing. We look to Him for every good and perfect gift. We look to Him for absolutely everything that we need in our lives. It is God who is the supplier of our needs and we can trust Him. But we also see that as His creatures, that we are put here for His purpose. We are put here for His glory. So as we continue there with the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, he says that we are God's offspring and we ought not to think that the divine being or the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Rather, the nature of God is what shapes everything else. It was the times of this ignorance, this pagan ignorance that thought they could make a God in their own image. The times of this ignorance God overlooks, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. Now here through verse 31, Paul has displayed God's absolute sovereignty over everything in creation. First of all, we see the patience of God. That He was dwelling with these individuals and He overlooked our ignorance. We are thankful today that God continues to overlook our ignorance, but we also are knowing that God has fixed a day that He will judge all of mankind. That there is this time coming, this judgment day, when we will have to stand before the Lord and give an account for every idle word. When we will bear in the body the things done 
in the body. When we will be a part of that scene that we read about in the end of Revelation, when John said, I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before the throne of God, and the books were opened, and the dead were judged by the things that were written in the books. You see, there is this judgment coming, and we need to know that. That because God is sovereign, because God is creator, He is the one who gets to judge us. He is the one who gets to determine what our life is worth and what our life is going to be eternally existing as. But He's also the one then who has the opportunity to be gracious. You see this graciousness again as God's sovereignty over creation is displayed in that He has sent this man to be the judge, but He has also signified that He is the judge by raising Him from the dead. That death that came into the world through sin has been reversed by what Jesus has done, by what is accomplished through the humanity of Christ is our great hope, our great expectation, and the great revelation of God's grace that we can be saved. Because when we sin, we understand that we deserve death. That's what the wages of sin is. But all of us who have sinned know that we can be raised from the spiritual death. We know that we can be raised to spiritual life. We know that we have this opportunity. Because as we have been studying through the book of Romans, we get to chapter 6 and verse 3, and we see that we have been buried with Christ so that we can be raised with Christ. That we are raised to walk a new life. A new life that is free from sin. A new life in which we are no longer slaves to that old person that we were. A new life in which we are able to enjoy being with God. But we also, as Paul looks at here at Acts 17, we are also looking forward to our resurrection. Because Jesus has been raised, we see that death is not inescapable. In fact, death has been defeated and we are waiting to receive or take part in that victory ourselves because Jesus has been raised. The Apostle Paul wants us to understand this as he exemplifies it, explains it in 1 Corinthians 15, that if there is no resurrection from the dead, then we are of all people to be most pitied. But what does he say? But in fact, Christ has been raised. This then is our Hope that God who is Lord of all says you can be raised. You can have life. This is what your life can be in Christ. Why? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And He put you exactly when and where He wanted you to be for His own purposes, for His own glory, so that you could seek after Him, so that you could know Him and be in a relationship with Him. And all of these things are made possible by the One that He sent to be raised from the dead, to free us from the condemnation of sin and welcome us into this great experience of glory. Now, knowing that God is our Creator then we can begin to know what it is I need to know to arrange my life. Can you imagine that little bird that was going around town asking everything if they were his mother? If that little bird had been raised by that dump truck, you know what that little bird would have tried to be? Tried to be a dump truck. Well, that wouldn't work at all, would it? But since God is our Creator, We can go to God and arrange our life with the reality that He is our Heavenly Father, that He is our Creator. Now we need to know then that I am created by God and He made me with value and with purpose. There has never been a person on the face of the planet that does not have both value and purpose. Because God created each and every one of them. As David said, He knit me together in my mother's womb. That's true for the 8 billion people on the planet and the 8 billion people that lived before us. God made each and every one of them with both value and purpose. Whoever you are, you mean something to God. Wherever you are and whatever you look like, you mean something to God and you have purpose 
from God. But you also need to know that God gives you your identity. God made you to be what God wants you to be. He made you a man. He made you a woman. So that you can glorify God as a man or as a woman. He made you to be what He wants you to be. And we do not get to decide that we're something else. We need to submit to God and understand that He is our Creator, He is our Sovereign, He is our Judge. And the way that He made us is the way that we need to praise Him. He made us without fault, without failure, to be exactly what He wants us to be for His glory. We also need to know that God's hand is in the past just as much as it is in the present and in the future. As we have studied this morning from Revelation 4, we see God describing Himself as the one who is, was, and will be. Outside of time, He holds all of time in His hands. Outside of creation, He holds all of creation in His hands. He's involved in your life. He puts you when and where He wants you to be, but He still works providentially. He still answers prayers. He's still acting. He's still interested in you, and He's still working. You may not understand what God is going on, what God is doing in your life right now, but you can look back throughout the great heroes of the Bible and see they didn't understand all the time either. In fact, most of them didn't know all the time what God was doing. You'll see the greatest of them crying out to God because they don't understand what God is doing. But over and over again what we see is that God's in control, God's guiding everything, and God's got your life in His hands. We also need to know that God is not silent. God has spoken and that changes everything. He has spoken as He reveals Himself in creation as we can examine its design and see that there must be a designer. He speaks to us as He continues to provide as we see in Acts 14 and verse 17 that He left not Himself without witness. But He also speaks to us in His Word. And as we read His Word, God speaks to us because every word of this book is God-breathed. It is inspired. And as we read of this book, we find the main focus is Jesus, who is the Word, the communication of God, about God, who God is, so that we can see our God enfleshed for us. God has spoken. He is not silent. He speaks to your life even now, if only we would be willing to listen. But we also finally need to know God as both judge and Savior. That He is the one appointed a day to judge all mankind. But He is also the same God who has sent His only begotten Son to die for us. So that all who are in Him might live. We need to hold both of those things in our hands. We need to understand that the God who judges is the God who saves. The God who wants us to be in heaven is the God that died so that we can be in heaven. The God who is standing now waiting for you to come. Waiting for you to make that great confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, He is ready now to confess your name before the Father, to own you in heaven. And that Jesus who is buried is the same Jesus into His body. You can be buried and you can be raised. You can be raised to walk in newness of life just as Jesus was raised and just as Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father this morning, So you can be raised to be with God forever in that heavenly morning. Are you ready? Are you ready to come to the one that gave you life? Are you ready to come to the one that provides for your life? Ready to come to the one that nurtures your life? The one that guides your life? The one that has a plan for your life? The one that has purpose for your life? The one that gives quality to your life? And the one who offers you eternal life? Are you ready to come to Jesus? Why not now, as together we stand and sing?
Five hundred or ugh, number nine hundred fifty-three. Are there any more announcements that need to be made at this time? Okay, I've got two. Uh, we have a VBS teacher crafts teacher sign-up sheet in the back. It is on the little table with the youth calendar and all that in the foyer. And then, if you want the youth group calendar, it'll be virtual calendar. It's a Google. Google Calendar. You can see either me and Cole and give us your email and we'll give it to you. But anyways, the closing song will be number 953. We'll sing the first and last verses. Then have our closing prayer. <clears throat> when God showed Noah in the grand old ark, he put a rainbow in the cloud.